come with me while I go on my evening walk. So I used to be a really avid runner. Now I'm just a walker. Mostly because I haven't worked out or ran in a couple of years. So in order to get back into jogging, I'd have to like start working out. And I'm building up to it. Um, my life has been in kind of a shambles over the last couple of years. And so while I'm walking, I want to think and talk about what my message is. And you get to look at my floofster while he pees on everything. So I was adopted from infancy and they didn't even tell me until I was in high school that I was Filipino. This family was extremely abusive. I was hit a lot. I witnessed sexual abuse and molestation. Um, I was the one who made them report it. <laughs> which got me in trouble. Not, oh, that bad guy went to jail. Um, I got in trouble for making the family look bad. <sighs> anyway, so there's physical abuse, all that good stuff. And one thing that my adopted mother did quite a bit was to create this space where my existence um, was her doing. You know, had she not adopted me and, and rescued me and saved me from the inevitably horrible life that I was going to be experiencing and living, had she not adopted me, then I owed her some sort of gratitude I definitely owed her good behavior. I could not misbehave. Um, gratitude in the form of making her look good. See, I'm Filipino. Filipina. And so she put me in all kinds of things. Gymnastics, piano lessons, uh, made me take like extra math classes because she was absolutely convinced that she deserved for rescuing me the Asian prodigy. So I don't know if anybody listening or watching is going to understand this. I'm hoping some people are in my age cash. Uh, but in the 80s, it was like this big thing for child prodigies of Asian descent. Uh, to be kind of like plastered all over TVs, playing violin, piano, doing crazy math problems, solving the Rubik's Cube, all that kind of crap. And, of course, my adopted mother wanted it on this. She wanted that attention. And she would glow. Um, you see, I wasn't very talented in a lot of things. Still not. Um, but I became a decent artist, very good writer, and any time I made any kind of achievement, it was hers to absorb the accolade. It was hers to have and not mine. She was always at the front of accepting the reward, the certificate, whatever. Uh, she was always in the pictures, <laughs> um, which is probably why I can't take compliments or, you know, I want to succeed, but at the same time, please don't put me on a stage and tell me I did a good job. Uh, huge fear of that. I, I don't have fear of public speaking. I'm actually quite good at public speaking, but if it involves receiving any kind of award, it's pretty, it's pretty scary for me. So, what I'm hoping to build 
my vision is to have a space for transracially adopted individuals to just talk about like what goes on. Um, in my TikTok, I had mentioned, you know, even calling myself Filipina and learning about the culture. I was raised by white people in Northeastern, very German Pennsylvania. And I was never given the opportunity to learn or be educated on my culture, on my history, on my heritage or my ethnicity. I wasn't given that. And so it does feel like I'm culturally appropriating like my own history. And I'm hoping to find more people that can help me kind of walk through that, especially with the discussions of the day. How do I, you know, heed the call of my ancestors essentially without feeling like such an outsider? In every space I've been in, I've been an outsider in one way or another. I have epilepsy, I have autism, I very likely have ADHD. (coughs) I'm pass as white, but most people kind of give me that double look like, "Mm, but what are you? No, but really, but what are you? I get Hispanic a lot, which makes sense. Philippines were occupied by Spain for quite a bit, um, much of their history. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that there's more people out there that can help me discover. Um, The amazing thing about Filipino culture is they've been so welcoming. I have not met anyone of Filipino descent that's like, oh, you weren't raised in this? Get out of here. You know, they've all been like, oh, here's Balut, here's Lumpia, here's, uh, you know, Pansat Malabong, and eat some bibingka, and I try to learn Tagalog, and they all make fun of my accent. (laughs) But it's mostly the internal fear that I have of not being accepted. Because I never have been. Ever. (laughs) Anywhere. Growing up where I grew up, there wasn't a whole lot of black or international individuals. And being a brown color, personally, they didn't know what I was. I didn't know what I was. I didn't know how to describe myself. I was assigned a lot of ethnicities and called a lot of racial slurs because people just didn't know what I was and I couldn't explain to them what I was. And when I found out I was Filipino, nobody knew what that was. I didn't even know what that was. I had to go into books and was actually kind of disappointed to find out, you know, to be honest, my initial research, there's not that much information. I just learned like, hey, they were occupied by Spain for a hundred years or so and that's it. As I've gotten older, I've learned a lot more about the history and culture, and it's a lot deeper, but back in the 90s, there was no internet, so there was no um, learning in high school about who I was and and what I was. (laughs) So, because the other part of the trauma is that family continued to foster after I was adopted. And so, children, you know, we as children grow relationships quickly, easily. The bonds are deep. We're so trusting and loving and so, children are beautiful souls. And, you know, so you, there's this trauma of children constantly coming and going, coming and going, and oftentimes their children, I remember changing the diaper of a baby who was in like a full body cast because of the abuse that she had been taken away from. And as a child, I should probably have not been doing that. What are you smelling? Come on. 
And so, while it is amazing that the United States is this kind of diaspora, it's not beautiful yet. It's not there. We haven't gotten to the place where there's a good appreciation for everyone equally. And it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to find my history. And it's tough to find a crowd of people that fully understand <clears throat> what it feels like to be so outsided of everything your whole life. Uh, I was never a part, truly a part of my family. They made it very clear from day one that I was adopted and that I owed them my life. And I never felt accepted or loved or part of them. The foster children coming and going, so... And they don't say goodbye. So when foster children leave a home to either go on to their next placement or back to their homes, you just come home from school and they're gone. There's no thanks for the memories. You know, and as a permanent child in that situation, that's very difficult. Um, To never know what you're coming home to. And after I witnessed the molestation abuse those two sisters had lived with us for five years and they were my sisters <laughs> from five to ten that's those are the formative ages and I came home after I knew they had their therapy session because we agreed that they would talk about it in therapy <laughs> tell on them essentially we were ten you know <laughs> so that's how we worded it gotta tell on them they were just gone. And so I had just witnessed something horribly traumatic. Um, and nobody talked to me. My mom didn't talk to me. My dad was prayed over by the pastor of our evangelical fundamentalist church, essentially, when the police came. And... And that was it. I was alone. He went to jail. My adopted mom blamed me for a long time. Physically abused me. (laughs) Then just flat out (coughs) essentially acted like I wasn't even there. I didn't even exist after a month or so of torture. Because I had ruined the family. I would broken us up. You know, we don't tell our secrets to outsiders. And look what you did. And then after that, at 10 years old, I was on my own. She started charging me rent, so she started taking my babysitting money because I was already babysitting for families at church. I couldn't take showers longer than 15 minutes. I had to pay for my food. 10 years old. I mean, I look back, my daughter's nine now, and I look back and I just think, oh my God. I would literally walk down the hill to the grocery store as a shop right to get like what little I could afford. So I mostly lived on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and um, cheap spaghetti, canned spaghetti. Um, I had a full blown, this like morphed into a full blown eating disorder. Um, well, two, because uh, I would starve myself and then I would binge and purge and and I didn't really relate the two I did in high school when I finally got to high school I did finally like you know what I am forcibly throwing up and taking laxatives because that's the only pain that I can handle right now that's the pain I can feel so I couldn't feel the pain of the abandonment while still living with the person who abandoned me. I couldn't feel that. I couldn't process that. But the physical pain that you have when you overeat and then throw it all up and 
that's a lot that's very physically painful that was the pain that I could handle um, she took me to a Christian therapist who I never spoke to because on the first day the first session she handed me a journal and said this is going to be your prayer journal and what you're going to do is you're going to write your problems in here and you're going to send them up to God and he's going to heal you and I don't know how long or how many sessions she tried to force me to go to, but I do remember literally never speaking, not saying one word <laughs> because I had already been praying to God <laughs> my whole life <laughs> and sending everything up to God. And he had never, not even so much as whispered. So now, you know, I was already abandoned by God in childhood. Now I was abandoned by my mother. So, trauma. It all kind of ends up running together, doesn't it? <laughs> this was supposed to be just a video about me discussing what I'm supposed to accomplish <laughs> with my outlets here while enjoying the scenery of a beautiful walk with my dog. So that's what I want. A community, not with experts, not with medical experts, but with people like me who feel like me, who understand how I'm feeling, who can empathize and hear my words and know what I'm not talking about. Not just feel sorry or pity, but know in their souls what I'm talking about. Are there more of you out there? <laughs> Come find me. Come talk to me. Let's heal. Let's go on more walks together. Let's learn to enjoy the moment. Even if it's a memory of pain. Come with me. Thank you.